Tonight, we have a very special SG. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose guitar information, the Troglis Guitar Show. Tonight, we're talking Tony Iommi, and not his monkey SGs this time. We're talking the original batch of late 90s, early 2000s Gibson creations. I'm sorry to disappoint you, it is not the custom shot version, but look what somebody set our combo lock to. Those cheeky guys, all sixes. This is the 2001 Gibson SG Tony Iommi signature, and it's got the cool case. It's got a cross on the shroud, it's got a signature there. As you just saw, it had a cross on the case as well as Gibson USA, but the guitar itself is a very interesting SG because it has his then fairly new signature pickups in it. It has 24 frets, and we've got cross inlays, all ebony, no binding, with some other unique specs that you would really only find on the Tony Iommi signature. So let's see, how does it feel taking this thing out of the case? I can already tell it's gonna be neck heavy, but it has this really sweet all blacked out vibe, and I'm really interested to try his signature pickup set. But nice, it actually has a true ABR1 bridge installed on it, and it's kind of 61 in style, just having a single pick guard over here that is single ply, so it just kind of disappears. And then as far as our neck profile, it's not quite as wide feeling as I was expecting. It's still very similar to like a 61's neck, but it's got a little bit of roundedness to it. But this was the Gibson USA run that followed the Custom Shop iteration, and the Custom Shop one was actually the very first signature SG ever created. Put things into perspective, 1993 is the opening of the Custom Shop as we think of it today. It's a completely separate division from Gibson USA. As they opened it, they started to experiment with signature artist models of other guitars. So we're talking things like the Slash Snake Pit, Ace Fraley, you've also got the Joe Perry custom shop model, among a few others. So that's all really late 90s that we start doing that, but it's 1999 when they first associate an artist with the SG. So let's take a look at these side by side. For the most part, the USA stacks up in its own unique way that's a little bit more budget friendly. So here's the biggest differences. The custom shop has the signature on the headstock, rather than having the usual SG crown. The USA just moved the signature to the truss rod cover. The custom shop featured locking Spurzel tuners, whereas the USA got regular Grovers. The inlays are very different. The USAs are kind of small and they do not go all the way up the fretboard. They stop at the 12th fret. But the big daddy over here gets large cross inlays that are bold in your face all the way up. And they're not mother of pearl. Believe it or not, they're made of sterling silver. The custom shops also got binding along the fretboard. The custom shops had two different finish options, red and black, whereas the USA only had ebony. But both of them are offered in left and right handed variations, and they only made approximately 250 of the custom shop ones. They initially said they were only going to make 200, but we've seen some after that, so that's why we say like 2 to 300, 250 seems to be relatively accepted. But after these two, we didn't really see too much Tony Iommi until 2020 when the Custom Shop Monkey SGs came out. And now currently, we've got the Gibson USA Monkeys, as well as the Epiphone Monkeys. Seeing it side by side a regular SG from 1962, you can tell he definitely made this thing his. It is a completely different beast. But if you were thinking, hey, what about Angus Young? Well, don't worry, his signatures came just slightly after his. This is an example of the Gibson USA version, but he also had Custom Shop ones. And we documented the prototype of this guitar in this episode right here. I think what they were trying to do here was get a signature artist of a 68 style and a signature artist of a kind of 61 style. So you can have both in your collection for different tones and different meanings. And needless to say, both the Custom Shop and Gibson USA versions of the Tony Iommi's are very, very rare. You cannot always find these available on the market. So let's go ahead and throw this rare treat on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. Well, this went from a six to a pretty solid eight and a half after a good polishing job, but let's check out the Tony Iommi signature humbuckers. They're pretty interesting. They're epoxy coated on the back and they have the patent applied for decal on them. As far as the wire, it has a thick one, very similar to Gibson's four conductor wiring. And the bridge pickup has more of the same. I was trying to find you guys some specs of this and I found a page that I don't think was published on Gibson's website. It looks like they might be bringing the Tony Iommi signature humbucker back. But they used to sell these things separately as well. Spec wise, they are indeed four conductors, so you can do series, parallel, split coil operations, whatever you want. They're fully wax potted and epoxied. They do that to get rid of unwanted feedback. They usually have an output around 13.7k ohms. And both of the magnets are Alnico 2s with ceramic wiring. And it's designed for razor sharp highs and 
well-defined mids and lows according to our marketing materials. I first ran into these pickups when trying to restore old L6S guitars because it has a very similar look not having any pole pieces exposed. That's why they look so different as compared to other humbuckers that Gibson usually creates. But just like the old Tarbax, you can't remove the pickup covers because they're essentially permanently bonded with the wax and epoxy. And as far as how they get the mounting rings, they actually just have a bar that they sit over top of that, probably when they dip it. So it is possible for that to fall off, but it's unlikely if you're not abusing it. But we've got some light wear to the outer covers. Nothing too crazy, just some pitting. And within the circuit, the bridge is 15k ohms, the neck at 15.3, and the middle for fun, 7.57. Here's our neck pickup cavity on one of these. It's got the long neck tenon. And the bridge pickup cavity has some minor marks in here, although I can't really read what they say. Otherwise, pretty basic stuff, except for some sort of a goof. So there's additional screw holes here. So that could either mean it was a mess up at the factory or somebody has swapped pickups in here. So we'll have to look at our control cavity to see what the truth is. I would not be surprised if this was a factory boo-boo because two of them over here were nice and filled in and they're just a little bit too high, whereas these ones, they didn't fill any existing holes. I told you earlier how it was kind of cool that this has an ABR1 bridge. I'm not exactly sure when the SG switch over, but I think it's the mid-2000s when they start using Nashville style, as far as the 90s 2000s SGs go. So I don't think this is necessarily a special spec to this one, but it is special by today's standards if you like historically correct appointments. Your tailpiece is full weight with a long casting mark. This one was definitely a player. It's got scratches pretty much all over, but the polish job removed the bulk majority of it. There was a small area down here that chipped down to the wood, so I used my Gibson lacquer pen to touch that up. It looks pretty good. Then we have a prominent seam line showing in the body, so that means it's likely a three-piece body. Now, it's not separating or anything. It's literally just where the body pieces come together. Sometimes the lacquer will sink into that join line, and then you'll start to see it. The only time you have to really worry is when you see, like, cracking of the finish. That means it's actually coming apart. We've got a couple of light dings around our knobs, but it's just regular two volumes, two tone controls with the output jack on the front. Three-way toggle switch over here, and this is what it looks like with our pick guard removed. I think they could have got away with not having a pick guard on these. They look pretty sweet, but here's a look at the Gibson USA pick guard. This one's got scratches all over, and it's just single ply. Moving on from our mahogany body, we've got the mahogany neck with the unbound ebony fretboard. A little bit lonely up here in the soloing areas, but you do still have your side marker inlays to help you know where to go. And again, that is 24 frets, a full two octave scale. And then we get our crosses, not sterling silver, but a pearloid material, which is always hard to see from seller's photos. So it's great that we have an up close look now. The frets are in pretty nice shape on this one, just minor wear. You get a 12 inch fretboard radius with your 24 and three quarter inch scale length, a nut width of 1.7, 2.09 by the 12. First fret neck up 0.83, and wow, 0.937 by the 12th. Here that is on the contour gauge. You can definitely see how wide it is. First fret, 12th fret. So definitely wide and thin. However, it's got a little bit more chunk to it than some SG reissues that we've had in the past. First our truss rod, perfect shape, and you can see the mahogany wood grain. The truss rod cover itself just has Iomi's signature on it. It's not actually signed, it's just made this way. Then I love how the lacquer's just aged enough to give you a very light yellowed hue. These early signature guitars are just so special because they have a certain look to them. They're a little bit primitive yet. They haven't finely tuned the details, and I love it for that. But that's a real Mother of Pearl Gibson logo, as well as your crown. Moving over to the back, you can see more of what you saw on the front, such as that seam line we were talking about showing. And we've got some impressions and scratches on the back. A little bit of belt buckle worming right there. Being over 20 years old, I would say it's not too bad for one of these. They tend to get trashed because they're so much fun. So we do have some fun markings on here. 1022? Replaced! No, gotta lift this up. It says 01 underneath there. So that's just the date that those were installed. Love that that employee actually marked them. And, and if I had to guess, MF are their initials. Now, as far as have other pickups been in here, I could honestly see it being either way. Got the yellowing around the solder, so it's likely original. But here's the end of the four conductor wiring of the pickups. Stock from the factory, they don't utilize them. It's just a regular two conductor. So in my opinion, I think that was just a factory goof up. But I say that with about 95% confidence. The edges are looking pretty nice. Just minor wear. Here's the side that you see while you play. And now the neck. You can't see a line where the fretboard joins to the neck, 
That's pretty common on these as the fretboards shrink and or expand. This one's actually pretty minor, but it is visible all up and down the board. Thankfully though, it's much more minor on the side that you see while you play. And then when I first unboxed this, there was like a really gummy feel right here in the cowboy cord area. I was scared it reacted with a stand, but thankfully polishing it up got all that gone. However, you still do see like a light discoloration. It could be a stand mark. We'll find out under black light. But it's right there and just very hard to see. And you've got some minor impressions on the back. Our Grover tuners cleaned up nicely. And then we've got our serial number back here dating it to 2001. Time for the black light test. This one has a great even glow pretty much everywhere, not even seeing too much sweat absorption in the usual areas. But there's some lacquer chipping at the top of the headstock here. But as I told you earlier, I did perform a small touch up down here that shows under black light. And I just want to re-emphasize, a black light test does not show you if it's the original finish. It shows you the evenness of the finish. So in theory, if everything was even glowing like this, it should be the original one, unless the entire thing was refinished at once. So do not use the black light test for a guitar that you're suspicious has been refinished. This is really just looking for touch-ups or repairs that didn't get completely refinned. Now you could also use it if you know the guitar is from like 1963 and the finish doesn't glow as much as you think it would. Yeah, that's one way you can kind of use it, but that's not necessarily the best way to use this. It's really just to see you know, is there a little bit of wear right here from a strap? Was there a heel break that was completely touched up? Because it won't glow in those areas, or not as much. So this neck is actually looking perfectly good. Got a little bit of a chip right there, but nothing too bad. All said and done, this one is 7 pounds, 1.5 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. First things first, neck dive test. Yeah, I could feel that one right as soon as I took it out of the case. Let's see how these pickups sound anyway. Interesting, that neck pickup is incredibly dark. It's like a normal humbucker, but with the tone rolled down a bit. Now our bridge. is the best way to put it. Let's try some distortion. It's a very focused mid rangey sound. The middle has a very distinct roundedness to it. Now 
let me know all about the Tony Iommi Gibson USA Signature SG. What are my final thoughts on this thing? Well, you can't deny it that it has a very unique look to it. From the straight up unbound ebony fretboard to your cross inlays, there's no mistaking this thing for any other SG. But yet at the same time, it's not really overly plastered with his name. Somebody just might say, hey, you've got a cool customized SG. So you could build your own identity with a guitar like this. But for me, I didn't really like this guitar too much. Very neck heavy. But having the Tony Iommi pickups was kind of interesting. It was my first time trying them. I'm not gonna say I loved them. Not gonna say I hated them. I would just need some more experimentation. Your first impressions might not be the best until you understand what they're more better suited towards. All right, troglodytes, if you're interested in being the next owner of this one, you can find it on my website, troglodytesguitarshow.com. Otherwise, we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.